I need to push another button here to say go and do this. OK, I just needed to push another button. So I didn't push enough buttons. Um, I think I am live now. Is this better? Can people hear me now? All right. Gotcha now. OK, great. All right. Um, so I apologize. I'm still getting set up on this video streaming stuff. It's still a new thing for me. All right, so we're getting set up here. And uh, we're going to talk about WASIC file system, Oracle file system APIs. So let's dive into it. Um, I'm going to set up a screen share on Jitsi here. So I'm using Jitsi to do the live streaming. It's kind of a very easy way to get it set up so I can do screen sharing and um, uh, run a live stream with, with different options here. So uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I'm going to share this window here, which is my HackMD window. I'm going to set up a new note. And um, pull this in from GitHub. I'm going to pull in my uh, so like my own fork of the Wasp System repo, which I'll hack on during this meeting. And then after the meeting, I'll, I'll filter this up in, into the PRs to the, the main repo. Um, I created a branch just for this stream. And we're going to go to the WIT directory. And we're going to look at wasicprocessing.wit.md. So a few things have changed, actually, since, um, since we last uh, did a live stream. Um, one of them is that we now have uh, worlds. We actually have uh, all the all the WASI proposal videos that I maintain are now upgraded to the new with Gen. So we have worlds and interfaces and other fun things. So is what I want to do here. OK. So now I'm looking at um, the Wazi file system API in my browser. Let's make sure I can double check that this looks right. OK. In streaming video, you can see my editor. People are saying hi. Excellent. Hello, everyone. All right, so last time we got into this old ways, I actually wanted to highlight one thing that changed up at the top here. Um, previously, so we have this file size type. Um, the file size is U64 because uh, 64 bits is basically enough for talking about any kind of size of an individual file on any file system, even something like ZFS, which is sort of famous for having 128-bit uh, file system. It, the individual files themselves cannot be more than 64 bits, uh, 2 to the 64 uh, in length. Um, so this is this is sort of like the, the big enough for anyone uh, file size. Uh, but previously, Wazi had another type def, which was just plain size. And that was previously uh, U32, because the API was sort of um, written for, for Wasm32. Uh, but of course, uh, Wasm64 is also coming. And it's kind of had this question of, like, what are we going to do? Are we going to have two different Wazi APIs, one where size, um, which is like the equivalent of the C size T type with a Rust U size type? Um, would that be just different? And then we'd have like two different APIs. There's like Wazi file system 32 and Wazi file system 64. And um, so the change here is that uh, actually, no, what we can do is just use U64, even for things which in, in POSIX would be a size. So this is for things like the, the PV system call, PV system call, where you're passing in a buffer, where you're going to read a, in, in a buffer, and the buffer is going to have to fit memory. And so the size really refers to the size of the that could fit memory, which means ordinarily it would be natural for it to be the size type um, of your of your architecture or your, your pointer size. Um, but what we can say here is that if we just always use U64, um, then it's possible for you to request, like when you do a read, it's possible for you to request to read more bytes than your address space could hold. Um, and then that will just fail uh, without a memory condition. So that's something we can we can just fix. Um, applications shouldn't ever read. Uh, or they shouldn't ever try to be reading a buffer of, of multiple gigabytes uh, from a single read system call anyway. 
And so it won't come up very often. And using U64 there means we have a single API between WASM32 and WASM64. Um, and it also kind of clears up a nice, um, a nice issue as we go beyond linear memory, we don't get WASMGC. Um, it also means we don't have to have like an API that's sort of specialized for, for WASMGC as well. So we have just like one API that can talk to all the things. And that's really what we're aiming for at WASI is to not have given APIs for different users. We want to have one API that works well for everyone. All right, I think we got through a few of these uh, last time. Um, I did want to point out a few changes here. Um, we reorganized uh, non-block and, and put all the sync things next to each other. Um, there's some interesting questions about sync things that have come up um, pretty recently. Um, in fact, there's an issue on this in the Wasi file system repo about some of the sync issues. Um, and there's actually a few more things I want to talk about here as well. So one of the challenges is that um, sync, desync, and rsync all refer to a very specific guarantee that POSIX describes um, called synchronized file I.O. integrity completion or synchronized I.O. data integrity completion for desync. Uh, and POSIX is a very specific definition of what this means. Um, it's sort of, sync is, is sort of equivalent to after every write doing an f-sync automatically. Um, but in theory, um, the, the sync flag here is, is better than just doing a write followed by a separate f-sync because it means that the OS can make sure that the sync happens before the write completes. Yeah, so that it, the write is considered atomic in some sense. So we sort of don't have this worry about what happens if there's something in between the write and the sync. The OS can just say, I'm going to take this thing. I'm going to write it straight to the disk. It's not going to hit any kind of buffer in between. It's going to go straight to the disk. So no one will ever see it in kind of this intermediate state uh, or like this, like I've, I've written it and cached it and I think I'm done, but someone sees it, it's not done yet. I'm going to write it all the way to the disk first um, is what this sync flag can do. Um, so it's kind of a neat feature. Um, and, and there's uses for it. Uh, the trouble is that uh, at this point, um, no one has done the work to evaluate exactly whether we can provide this guarantee uh, on, on various platforms. Um, so some, some Unix platforms have a sync flag that we can just you know forward this on to and have it work. Um, but on Windows, there is no direct equivalent of this sync flag. Um, there's a flag which is sort of equivalent to, um, so there's a way to get something sort of equivalent to an f-sync but not an actual sync, which would sync the file metadata as well. Uh, and so there's actually some consideration of like, maybe we should remove the sync flags uh, because uh, they're they're making a very specific guarantee and it's not clear to us if we can actually provide that guarantee. It's an open issue. I don't actually know what we'll do yet, but I just wanted to kind of call that out as a thing that's, that's kind of in play. Um, and there's a new flag. Since last time we streamed about well, Puzzle System, there's a new flag here, which is the mutate directory flag. Actually, I see a question in the chat here. Is the patch.wazi.io uh, import path new? Yes, this is a new thing, um, new name pattern. So let's go back up to the top here and get this um, use package.wazi.io.inputstream output stream. Um, and so this is new width syntax. I mentioned earlier that we had upgraded to the latest width bind gen. And so in this new width version, we have the ability to import types from other width, other width um, interfaces in the same package. Um, the details of exactly what a package is are still being figured out, but for now, we'll just assume that Wazi IO is in this package along with Wazi System, um, and it's also a thing called Wazi Wall Clock, which which we're importing from the Wazi IO and Wazi Clocks proposals, respectively. So basically, just importing types. Wazi IO defines these types called input stream and output stream, and we'll use them below. And Wazi Clocks defines this type called date time, which we'll use below. So. Um, Jump down into, uh, I want to talk about mutate directory. One of the big changes we're making in Wasi file system from preview one to preview two is we're getting rid of the writes bit field. So previously in preview one, um, every file descriptor had essentially a bit field associated with it of up to 64 bits. Um, that basically, there was a bit for everything you could do with the file descriptor. There's a bit for read, a bit for write, a bit for fsync, a bit for fstat, a bit for ftruncate, and, and so on. Lots of different bits. Um, and, and or, or usually they correspond to operation, but sometimes there was like, you had to figure out which bits to use. Like there's a bit for appending. So you had to know that like trying to open a file in append mode needed the append bit, um, but also using the F truncate to extend a file also needed the same bit sometimes. Um, and so these bits kind of got a little bit confusing in some cases of exactly which bits do which things and um, the kind of this business of inheriting. So when you, when you open a uh, file descriptor from, one file descriptor is the base of opender, you get a new file descriptor um, it sort of inherits the rights from the previous one. Um, and it wasn't ever very clear um, how that would exactly work in a WASI context. 
Um, and then the bigger picture for these writes is also that they, they weren't being used because they weren't in POSIX. Like no existing code out there, um, at least for portable code, is, is using these flags. Um, and so most code that people were reporting to WASI wasn't using these flags, and, and people weren't using them um, in new code they were writing from scratch. Um, and so it, it's the decision we made for, for PV2 was to remove the flags and dramatically simplify the API. Um, there's several things as you go through this where you'll see that um, the things that used to be flags are now like either the flags are gone or there's simplified flags that are, that, that are easy to read about. Uh, but there's one thing that the flags that uh, that people were using the flags for that I'm aware of, um, which is the ability to have a read-only directory. If you took away, if you took a, a handle to a file descriptor to a directory and unset the flags for doing any kind of mutation, writing, creating files, renaming files, that kind of thing, um, you unset those things, then you could say this this file descriptor gives me access to a read-only directory. And then anything I can get from it, anything I can derive from it, would also then be read-only because it would have this inheritance behavior. Um, and that's a useful property. Like people want to have read-only directories, especially when you're writing untrusted code. It's really nice to be able to say, you know, take this code, run it, give it access to this directory, and have it be read-only. Um, because I don't want this, I don't want this untrusted code, you know, mo modifying the contents of these things. I just want to read the files and not write anything. Um, so that was like the one big feature that we were missing after we took out the flags feature. So now we have a new flag that we're adding to provide it called mutate directory. So this flag is sort of uh, requested by default um, in most situations by like libc, uh, or it will be when we have a libc support for this thing. Uh, and when the flag is set, it means you can do mutating operations on directories, like creating files, renaming files, deleting files, that kind of thing. Um, and also opening files in, in writing mode. Now, when this flag is not set, then it basically acts like uh, a read-only directory. So that's you know, a fun feature that is uh, much simpler to use than the previous one version of it, but it gives you the same functionality. All right, scrolling down, uh, descriptor stats. Um, I think the main thing that's changed here recently is that these times are now date time because we can import the type from Wazi Clocks. So that literally is like a type import. So we have the same type as Wazi Clocks. So that if you are getting a timestamp and then ex asking the system clock for a time, you can compare the times. The size is the file size. That's that type we talked about before, which is 64 bits, which is enough for anyone. Um, the link count isn't really used very often, but it's there because POSIX has it. Um, the descriptor type is the type we saw above. Um, the device and item number, there's a PR open on the WASA Vasa repo about should we have device and iNode. I think I talked about this last time, so I think I'm not gonna go into too much more detail here unless people have questions. All right, AT flags. Um, do we follow sim links or not? Uh, I think we talked about some of these last time as well. Um, permissions. Um, this is also, there's a potentially open issue on this as well um, in, in the WASI repo about uh, permissions. Um, this adds the simple ability to, when you're creating a file, to create it and request that the file be marked as readable, writable, or executable, which is a step up from PV1. We didn't even get to say this. They just sort of pick uh, permissions for you. Um, this is missing the ability to, on Unix to, to control the difference between user, group, and other. Um, we're, we've sort of hedged on that a bit because Windows doesn't have these concepts. They're not really portable. And any kind of portable program shouldn't have any kind of knowledge of the groups on a particular system. Um, and it, it arguably shouldn't even have knowledge of the user or like other things running as the same user because we're supposed to have sign, sandboxing and a finer granularity than the Unix user. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit confusing what these should mean, but um, this at least gives us the ability to say what we want for the file. And it's possible in the future we could add other flags that could uh, provide permissions without having to necessarily commit to saying exactly what they mean. All right. So I think I talked about some of these earlier as well, directory entry. Um, this also has an inode. If we get rid of the inode number in the, the stat, let's we'll get rid of it here as well. Um, which actually is interesting to look at while we're here. Um, dir entry becomes very simple, especially if you get rid of the inode. There's only two things. When you iterate over a directory, you get two things. You get the string name of the file, and you get the directory, the descriptor type of what the thing is, um, with directory, file, symlink, or other things. Uh, Erno is a pretty standard POSIX-like Erno, although uh, two things I want to say here while I'm going by. Um, one of them is that uh, we've taken out the Erno codes for network operations. This only has the ones that have come up with plus system access. So WASI doesn't have a single Erno type. We have multiple Erno types. And we've, WASI file system only has the types that are correspond to file systems. And then WASI libc will take up the responsibility for providing a unified Erno space. 
Now, the other thing I want to point out here is that there's a really interesting issue on the Wazi Hostel repo. Um, improving the consistency in semantics. And it's about, you know, should we rename these error codes and, and everything else? So should we rename um, these error codes and um, I, I'm talking about internodes code video because that's most of them here, but there's other things that we could name as well. Uh, to change them away from their, their more POSIX like names to more readable names. Um, I kind of like this. I'm, I'm still kind of, um, I, I can see it both ways. I can definitely see the value in keeping the POSIX names because those are kind of the well known names that um, at least people in the, in the C and related worlds know very well. Um, and and Wazir system is roughly sort of aiming for POSIX like semantics. And it's nice to have kind of a direct correspondence of seeing a thing, Wazir system, and knowing what it is in POSIX that it should correspond to. Um, on the other hand, uh, we do have a lot of users that are not C users, and, and we're looking to, to really make that a big thing for WASM in general. And so um, the idea of making these names a little friendlier is kind of appealing. Um, I have to be a little bit careful because WASM file system is not meant to sort of be uh, a fully idealized file system API or, or even sort of like, and re let's reimagine what file systems are um, because we can go a lot of directions with that. Um, Wasi file system as, as it exists right now is aiming at just being, let's give you access to existing files that are out there and not try to reinvent what a file system is. And so we can we can change the names here, um, but at some level, these will still correspond to the same thing. We, will, we don't actually want to change the meetings or try to like rationalize the error now codes in some way. I think in the future, there's potentially room in Wasi for if someone want to, want to come along with like a higher level file system API, that would um, maybe have a better story for how to deal with Windows, maybe have a better story for how to deal with um, atomic files. Um, there's a variety of functionality that, that just doesn't work very well in, in a, a file system API, just because that's just how things work in, in POSIX and Windows that we could potentially do differently. Right now, I think the most important thing to focus on is like this, this CLI command line world that we're building. Um, I'm not sure if I talked about that on the stream, but that's, that's something we came up, that came up for the reason why they subgroup meeting, and I'll talk about it later. Um, but the idea is to give programs kind of the, the basic, you know, computing as we know it today experience. And that means giving them file systems as we know them today, rather than trying to like reimagine what a file system could be. So I go through uh, advice is just the advice codes. Um, descriptor. So here's actually another thing that changed recently uh, with the upgrade to wit. Uh, we still don't have resource types in WIT yet, but we're getting closer. And so now we have um, what I have is a to-do comment. And I realize this comment actually is not very clear uh, on what this means. But what this means is that, that um, we're conceptually declaring a resource here. That you know, when we have support in WIT for resources, this will become a resource. Right for now, it's a U32, which means it's an index into an applied global table. Um, if you look at WASG at all, you know that global tables, the idea of having an applied global table that would be shared among all components in a store is not uh, something we want to do long term, but it works for now to get the system up and running. And if we use this type alias, then we can we can very easily swap in our real descriptor when we have support for real descriptors. So a descriptor is sort of the POSIX, like this is a file descriptor. Um, there's some interesting questions we've been having um, about, about descriptors and uh, should we have a single descriptor type or should there be a separate file and directory types? If you look at WASM time, um, a lot of the code in WASM time was kind of written in anticipation of having separate file directory types. Um, and there's some nice things about it. Um, in, in practice, I think um, my kind of take on it right now is that like that's that's getting too far into the territory of trying to pursue some kind of idealized file system API. I think um, the practicalities here is that we want to have a single type because that's kind of how the positive APIs work. You call open, and you don't tell open, um, I want a directory or I want a file. There's a flag for a directory saying I require a directory. But if you don't do the flag, you can still expect to get a directory or a file dynamically. And it's not like you tell which one you're going to get so you can get a different type. Um, so I think it's too awkward to have separate types. And it's getting too far to the, like, you know, separate types are nice. But that's getting too far to the, like, let's, let's reinvent what a file system is territory. So um, my judgment right now is I think we're going to stick with uh, single type. Um, unless we kind of get other input uh, to to change our minds here. 
All right, and so uh, some other stuff here that's, um, I think it's new. I'm not sure if it, we actually talked about this last time. Um, but these are, these are really important, so I'm going to talk about them now anyway. Um, so at the top, remember, we had those imports of input stream and output stream. And now here's where we're going to use them. So this first function, read via stream, this is a function that's going to, first of all, take uh, this. It's going to be the, the receiver, essentially, of the, the uh, descriptor resource. So you're going to take a resource. You can say, read via stream on it. And you're going to pass it an offset of where you want to start reading. And it'll return an input stream, which is going to stream bytes reading from that position and, and proceeding onward until the end of the file. So this gives you an input stream. And an input stream is this thing we looked at in WASI IO. If you remember back in that, the stream of WASI IO, the input stream is just this generic stream of uh, currently bytes. Uh, input stream actually is kind of this placeholder for the future preview three um, integrated streams, where we'll have a, a stream built into the IDL. So we have some kind of scaffolding going on here with this input stream type. But the basic idea is that it's a simple generic stream over bytes. That we, we, we this input stream type, once you get one of these things, you don't know um, what it's reading from. It could be reading from a file, from a socket, or from totally unrelated things like HTTP connections or other things. Um, and it really isolates the consumer of the stream from the producer of the stream. So the consumer doesn't have to know what the thing is coming from or doesn't get to know what the thing is coming from. Um, it doesn't have to worry about behaving differently, depending on where things are coming from. So it's like, take a file, start reading at this position, get a stream to read from the file at this position. Write via stream is similar. You take this file descriptor, you say, I want to write to this file descriptor starting at this offset. And um, and then we take that and, and we get an output stream, which then you can write to. And as you write to this output stream, it'll write to the file. The one other kind of streaming mode for files that's useful is append via stream. So given a file descriptor, um, in fact, uh, looking at this, this is, this is a bug. So append via stream. I can find where we are here. Append via stream, which has a descriptor, and there is no second argument. Um, whereas read via stream and write via stream have an offset, append via stream doesn't need an offset because it's always going to append. Um, and append via stream is nice in the context of like if there are multiple writers writing to the same file. Uh, an appending stream will always append. Even if someone else has written data to a file, the append will always go to the end after that. So you don't have to worry about making sure you're trying to always write at the end. Uh, if, uh, complete the offset, write at the end, would have a, uh, a race condition between those two. An append via stream will always append at the end of the file. Um, so that's a useful thing to have. Let's jump back to this view. So we have these three streams. You can read via stream, write via stream, and append via stream. And one of the interesting properties about these streams is that they are independent streams. So you can have multiple views of the file, both reading, writing, or pending, and they don't interfere with each other, at least unless you're like literally writing the bytes that someone else is reading. Um, but uh, in, in POSIX, when you have a file descriptor, um, the file descriptor has like a built for a for file, has a built-in concept of what's position for my file. So I'm reading and I'm updating the position and if I do a file descriptor, I get two copies of it. Um, they share a position. So you're reading from one, it's causing the other one to read. So you don't really have two independent views. You have two sort of linked views um, on the same thing. Um, these streams here are fully independent. So if someone is reading from a stream, um, you can take a single file and hand out multiple streams to read from the same file at different positions or at the same position. They could be uh, any kind of different thing. They're totally independent. Um, and so the idea is that input stream, output stream, and, and the appending output stream um, are, are just fully independent things where the consumer or the user of it doesn't have to know anything about where it's going or synchronizing with someone else or coordinating with someone else. All right, if you guys, um, yeah, this is a performance hint. And so it means something on POSIX. Uh, I don't remember if that's a, as a meaning on Windows, but even if it doesn't, we can just do nothing because it's just a performance hint. I think there's a thing on Windows that can hand stuff. I forget what this off of that. All right, data sync. This is basically the, the F data sync in POSIX. Um, this one, OK, I think data sync is a thing that we can keep. Um, there's two things I want to say about it in, in passing. One of them is that I think I've been having discussions with various people about um, what does what does data, F data sync and F sync mean on WASI? Um, 
partly in the context of, of virtual file systems, where if we're talking to you know arbitrary virtual file system out there, or even something like a Fuse file system, or maybe it's a Windows file system mounted over a network on, on Unix, or you know lots of different kinds of file systems out there. And is it possible for WASI to specify the semantics of a data sync or an F sync operation and try to say like what kind of guarantees can we make about you know what state is your data in after a power failure? Um, and it seems really hard because not only are there different file systems out there, there's also like different OSs will make different guarantees. And even below that, um, different hardware will make different guarantees uh, in terms of hard drives. If the power goes out, some hard drives have extra um, like capacitance power built in to keep the drive moving and, and writing just fast enough to finish writing out whatever buffer it has, or at least they're supposed to. Um, so there's kind of different levels of, of guarantees of what actually happens and what kind of state you can rely on your data being after an abrupt crash. Um, and it's really hard for WASI, we're trying to be portable, trying to be like general across all these systems, people to describe exactly what happens or kind of make some kind of guarantee about that. Um, and so it's likely what I think what we'll do is kind of a semantic trick. We we'll just say that data sync is just the name of an effect. And so when the application does a data sync, what we can say is the, the behavior of this is that it doesn't F data sync in the underlying platform. Whatever the, the file system has will define its own concept of data sync, and then we'll just do that. And so that kind of is a, it's a bit of a dodge because what it's saying is it's saying that we can take the data sync semantics and offload them to the host and essentially transfer the responsibility for having consistent data onto whoever picked the file system, whoever picked the host, which might be the end user, might be a system administrator, might be the platform vendor. Um, someone else is going to make that decision. So it's not the application's job to obtain a guarantee that data will be synced. The application's job is to send out to F-Sync or F data sync and say, I've done my job. Now it's someone else's job to make sure that that F, F sync or F data sync means a useful thing on this platform. So if you really care about data integrity, then um, it's up to the user to pick a good file system and a good disk and a good network if applicable and not up, up to the application or up to the WASI runtime to sort of like um, compensate for a bad file system or a bad disk or a bad network. Um, that's not formalized anywhere. I just but just like this is kind of brainstorming about you know what can we even make data sync mean? What can we even say about it? And I think that's a thing we can say plausibly that would actually work. That we can say it just does a data sync, whatever that means in the underlying file system. All right, we have flags. Um, this is pretty boring. I'll talk more about this when we get to the set flags function. Uh, type just reads uh, what kind of type something is. Um, this is basically a subset of, of what you get from fstat, um, but it's kind of nice to have it because sometimes you really don't care about the full fstat and you don't necessarily need to read things like the timestamp just to get the, the type of the file. Um, and actually this can be kind of nice from a static analyzability point of view. To, if, a file, if a program is using the type function, but not the stat function, then we know that they're not looking at timestamps. Um, and timestamps can be used to, to you know, do side channels or leak information in various ways. So if we know the program is only using type, then we know it's not doing those things. It's kind of a nice property. All right, set flags. Um, so set flags, you can set some of the file descriptor flags. Uh, although looking into it, uh, we recently had an issue on the WASI file system repo that most of the flags in, in the WASI file system can't be set. Um, so all the like desync, rsync, sync flags, um, uh, as, as, including on Linux and, and, and other OSs, like you can't actually dynamically modify those flags. And so it doesn't make sense for WASI just to say that you could modify them if you can't. So we took those out. And now the only thing you can modify with the set flags are two things, append and non-block. And this is now out of date because um, with the new append via stream, um, we no longer have an append flag. There's no longer a concept of a file being opened in append mode because the way you append to a file is you get an append stream. Um, and so we don't actually even have an append flag. So now the only flag left that you can set flags on is non-block. Um, and non-block itself is kind of weird because um, in especially in Unix, uh, they never implemented non-blocking semantics for file systems. It was basically assumed that disks were fast enough that you just never had to have non-blocking mode for disks. Non-blocking was for sockets, not for files. Um, and so you can set non-block on a flag in Unix, uh, but it typically doesn't do anything. And so it's kind of an interesting question of like, should we even have a set flags function? Uh, because uh, you now we only have one flag left and it's not even very meaningful. Um, 
I think it's a, it's kind of a, maybe we should rename set flags to set non-block. In fact, have just a dedicated function just for the non-block flag. And maybe in the future, there'll be other flags we can set. We can add other functions for them. Kind of a lot of technical about. There's no PR for that yet, but um, we'll get there soon. All right, set size. This is um, like F truncate, I think, in POSIX. Um, you can increase the size, or you can make the size smaller. If you increase it, you're going to fill it with zeros. And yeah, there's a similar function to this called f allocate um, in, in POSIX, which is like, don't actually increase the file size, but increase the available storage of the file. So I can be guaranteed that I can, I can later on increase the file size without having it fail. Um, but that gets really weird to implement on Windows. So I think we don't have it anymore. And it's also kind of just a weird behavior in general. So I think we just took that out for portability reasons. Uh, but we still have set size. That's kind of the, the more important one of like take a file and either truncate it down or extend it with zeros. Set times, sets the timestamps. Um, there's kind of three different modes we can do here for timestamps. You can set a set a time. There's so one file system exposes two timestamps right now. There's the A time and M time that you can set. I think there's also a Creation time, or which other timestamp do we have in, in descriptor info? Descriptor flags, descriptor stat, that's what I'm looking for. We have E time is the last access time, M time is the last modification time, and C time is the last file status change. That's what it is. File status change. So you can't change that with set times, but you can change the other two. Um, so you can set it to. Um, New timestamp can either be you can set it to now or you can set it to uh, fixed time. Link at is creating a hard link. Um, people have reasonably asked we should even have this function. Hard links are kind of obscure and not super portable, but they do work on at least Unix and I think they work on Windows in some form. Um, at the point we have them, and I haven't had a strong reason to take them out yet. Um, there is another question for like, it, what if the what if the the source path is a symlink? Should we follow symlinks? Um, and so technically, there's a flag for that, but uh, some OSs don't support it, so I'm not sure if we'll keep that flag or not. It's also kind of weird to have a hard link follow a symlink. Um, we'll figure that out later. Uh, open at. This is like one of the biggies. This is one of the big things in a lot of us, and I really, this is why I'm sort of skipping over link at to get to the interesting stuff. I want to get to open at because this is the, the interesting thing we have. So open a file directory. Um, again, POSIX does the sort of dynamic typing thing. There's a single type, you get a file descriptor, which might dynamically be a file or directory. Um, so we kind of emulate the POSIX behavior here. Uh, this is much of the POSIX open at function. Um, We've changed from having the, the rights flags in PV1. Now we just have a fairly a POSIX like O flags, uh, which stands for open flags. And that might change if we do that uh, renaming PR. Um, we have flags uh, for the descriptor flags that you want to use for writing places where you can set things like sync, desync, rsync. Those things are also um, non block. Um, or also uh, the mutable directory, mutate directory flag. This is where you can request that. Um, and we also have additional rules. We had to write here saying, um, basically, you want to re-implement that behavior of inheritance. So if I have a read-only directory handle, I should only be able to get other read-only directories from it. I can't take it and suddenly get a new handle that's, that's writable and then be able to write from there on. It's like it's, it propagates to you. Once it's read-only, everything you derive from that will also be read-only. And we've added this mode so you can set the permissions of things. If you create a new file, this is the mode to use to create it with. So it returns a result. Um, like everything in this API, it returns a result, which means it could fail and return an arrow. And if it succeeds, you get a new descriptor. In the future, this will actually be one of the, the, the one function to think in the API that gives you an owned descriptor. Um, it's not documented yet, but actually in the future, when we have resources, the, the component model documentation for resources has a concept of owned and borrowed handles. Um, ownership and borrowing. Uh, in, in the component model is checked at runtime, so it doesn't require any source languages to have any particular type checking. Um, so it works with all the languages. Um, and it 
Uh, it's similar to ownership and borrowing Rust, but it's actually done at runtime instead of compile time. So we just check it, and any language can use it. So open app will return you an owned descriptor saying, like, I created a new thing, and now I gave it to you, and you own it exclusively. Um, then all these other other functions where we're passing in this descriptor as a uh, this argument, um, those will be borrowed because like when you do a link at, you're passing it as the base. You know, you want the OS to do the link, and then it's done. And so the borrow goes away. That's kind of what a borrow means. I'm going to pass it to you. When the function returns, um, you don't have it anymore. Um, and it's actually kind of fun to point out that this kind of borrowing behavior is a natural kind of of, of revocation. So sometimes a question we get asked in the capability model is, do we have a way to model revocation? And this borrowing concept is actually kind of a really nice way to do revocation, at least the subset of, of the overall revocation problem, of being able to say, I can have this thing that I own. I own this descriptor. And I can pass it out to other components. They can borrow it to do things with it. But I'm not going to give it to them permanently. They're not going to hold on to it. I don't have to worry about I passed this to you, and now you have it forever. Um, I can revoke it. I can say, you know, I want that thing back. Uh, when, it, when it returns automatically. And so then, you know, over time, I don't have to worry about everything I've ever passed this thing to might still be holding onto this handle and might still have access to this thing. I need to revoke it. Um, if this is your use case, if we're just doing borrows past all these different things, then we know that once they return, the handle's already been revoked effectively. So that's kind of a simple form of, of revocation. Um, it also doesn't cover everything because there's also revocation cases where you have handles that you actually do want to, you know, have held out there. Um, and so there's other use cases for revocation. Um, Blasi's main story for those right now is that you can write proxy uh, components. You can say, I'm going to give you not the actual handle that I got from, the, from my API. I'm going to make my own handle, which then wraps this handle. And I can control what you can do through this wrapper, sort of the attenuation thing. Um, and you can implement uh, revocation through that. All right, read link at. Um, you get a path to read from, and it returns you the contents of the symlink. Um, I need to make a note here. That's one thing we did here in preview one is a, the question about like, can read that if, if the, the target of the symbolic link is an absolute path, what do we do? Um, because ordinarily, WASI doesn't deal with absolute paths. Uh, you can't open an absolute path because we want to make sure that every path is relative to some base file descriptor. Um, absolute paths are a really interesting hazard because they're sort of both, like the, the root of the file system is both the place where interesting <laughs> permissions happen and also interesting portability things tend to happen. They, they both tend to be focused off at the root of the file system. So like at the root of a Unix file system, you have things like slash temp, slash sc, slash var, slash sys, um, slash dev, those are all sort of interesting file systems, interesting directories, uh, because that's a place where the top root directory, and then you take a step down. Um, and, and taking a step down does not mean refining access. It means potentially getting more access in these cases. Like you type a step, like that step down into slash temp, and you gain from, from root to temp, you take that step down, you gain the access to write to slash temp, because temp is globally writable. Um, and so you kind of like, you, you take a step down, and you kind of gain some access. Um, but then it tends to be the case that below that, if you go significantly further below that, then people tend to use directories in a way that becomes hierarchical again, where taking a step down into subdirectories becomes um, either the same access or, or less access. Um, so um, we, we don't typically want applications thinking a lot about root directories and absolute paths. And so the question is, should readlink at be able to return uh, a path, which is an absolute path? Because if you could do that, um, if there happens to be, potentially by mistake, uh, a symlink to an absolute path in a host file system and an untrusted code can read that, the untrusted code might learn something about the directory layout of the host, um, which could potentially include things like usernames or, or uh, file system configurations, mount paths, that kind of thing. Um, and so I think what we want to say is that relink at should fail if the path is absolute. I'm going to make a note of that right now. Like at there we go. Oh, I'm lost. Okay, here we are. Okay, 
did we miss something here? I think I jumped ahead and missed something. Yeah, th we didn't talk about P read and P write, so how we missed these things. So P read and P write, those are the POSIX names, those could get renamed if we do the big rename PR. Um, and this is kind of like another way to read and write from files. So we have the, the read via stream and write via stream, which kind of do the streaming thing. Um, and then we have P read and pipe read write, where you say, like, given the file at this offset, just do a one time read at this offset. And so these are also stateless. They don't affect the state of the file. Um, in Windows, there's sort of this seek read function, which gives you kind of this random access behavior, but it has a side effect of mutating the current position of the file. Um, these don't do that mutation. They're just completely pure things. So they don't interfere with any other like, streaming views, and they don't interfere with each other. They can just be done at any time. These kind of represent the byte array view of a file. Uh, reader. Um, Quick note on reader, if you've ever implemented FD reader on Preview 1, you know it's a pretty complex API. This reader is much simpler. You just get a directory handle, and it gives you an iterator over directory streams, over directory entries. All right, we talked a bit about sync. Sync is like, uh, we talked about data sync earlier. Sync is, has all its similar considerations. Um, the difference between sync and data sync is that in sync, you don't just sync the, the contents of the file, you also sync the metadata of the file. Um, which is actually kind of interesting in, in a portability perspective because Windows doesn't have an obvious function for doing a sync. It just only has a function for doing data sync. And so it's kind of a question of like, if you do this, you know, what should the behavior be here? Um, this is where our potential trick of saying like, if the application does a sync, it'll do a sync with the underlying OS and, and whatever that means. And then maybe on Windows, what that means is nothing. And then um, we can basically sort of pass the buck onto the user saying, you know, if you care about the, the metadata of your files being consistent at the point where applications would do syncs, you should use a file system that supports that. Um, that's a pretty aggressive stance. I'm not sure if we'll take that strong of a stance, but that's potentially uh, one way of doing it. All right, create directory at um, stats. These are pretty straightforward. Took most of the time. This is where we, so we skipped ahead. Oh, I think I know what happened. Yeah, okay, so we skipped ahead. I'm gonna skip ahead again, move directory at, rename at. In link file at change file permissions at this is new from preview one change file permissions at in preview one we changed um from having like no permissions visibility and now we have this permissions so we can give this mode saying i want to make it readable make it writable make it executable and we have a separate one for files and directories um, I forget why we have that off the top of my head. It might be because of Windows. All right, I'm behind on my questions here. I'm gonna go take a quick chance to catch up my questions. Any idea when built-ins like streams will land? Uh, so streams are in the, the preview two proposals. Um, at least the, the, the WASI IO style stream, but we're using a, 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 a resource. Um, the plan, the, the roadmap for, for WASI is that preview two, the thing we're currently working on, um, will have these streams and all the APIs are all updated for it. And that preview three is when we're gonna add the stream type to WIT and we're gonna have sort of integrated streaming uh, with integrated async. So stream support in preview two for use of the read via stream, write via stream, yeah. So that's the idea is that preview two, we're gonna use these, these uh, stream types that WASI IO defines, they're defined Currently, the U32, which is standing in for a resource. So you can think of them as resources, um, which means you have a handle to a resource, and the handle is, is this thing you can pass around. So the stream implementation is defined in the WASI IO uh, proposal. If you look at the WASI IO repo that we looked at uh, in an earlier stream, um, that's where the stream types are defined. Uh, new time step has the no change option. I don't understand what that's what is exactly. Okay, so what that is, is um, if you want to change just the last modification time and not, not the last access time, or change just the last access time and not the last, just last modification time, you can set the one you want to change to um, here's the timestamp, and you set the one you don't want to change to none. So it allows you to just change one or the other without changing both. Um, I'm not sure how often people do that off the head, but it's a thing you can do in POSIX, so we're sort of preserving it. Uh, does OpenNet require file locks? Um, uh, I don't believe it does. Um, I don't intend to use file locks on either Unix or Windows for OpenNet. 
But if I use an absolute pass, it might be true to are not valid and return errors. Yeah, so the only open function we have in Preview 2, and in fact, this is true in Preview 1 as well, the only open function we have is this open app function where you have to give it a directory as the base to open from. And so if you give that thing an absolute path, you will get an error. That's how it is in Preview 1, how Wazi has been since the, the beginning, and so that's how Wazi Preview 2 will continue to work. Uh, and the idea here is that we're really trying to set up this idea of the component model um, avoiding a concept of a global namespace. We don't want to have applications aware of a, a global and implied shared namespace. Um, and so we're saying that we have this way of, of passing in handles with pre-opens that allows um, applications to essentially emulate having a global namespace within their instance, but it's really per instance. And there's um, in the open function, just take, you take these directory bases, um, you might have a way of looking them up, but then you can get paths underneath the directory bases. All right, I think I just cleared through the questions queue here. Um, keep asking questions, they're great. I will try to keep up on them. My current setup doesn't allow me to see the questions queue at my screen at the same time. Um, so I'd have to just check them occasionally. All right, change your permissions at. Um, file locking is a new thing in, in Preview 2. It's another new feature we're adding. Um, and so this is this is in part modified or motivated by the SQLite use case. So SQLite the database, it wants to lock its file to prevent itself from, from interfering with other, other instances of, of programs that are running the same database and accessing the same file. And so these are advisory locks. Um, advisory locks because that's what Unix gives us. And um, advisory means that if one person has a lock, um, another person attempts to acquire a lock, um, then they'll see the lock behavior. But if the other person doesn't attempt to acquire a lock, they just go ahead and try to open the file then the system won't stop them. So it sort of requires both sides to cooperate. It's like we both attempt to take a lock, then we'll get this locking behavior. Um, lock shared is like the read write access um, analog. Uh, it gives you, or no, lock shared is the read only analog. Essentially it gives you ability to, to read the file and there can be any number of lock shared uh, hold, lock holders at the same time because they're all sharing a lock. And typically that's used for read only access. And then there's lock exclusive, which is saying, I want to have exclusive. I want to be the only person holding this lock on this file. And so if everyone is opting in to these lock functions, then you can use these locks to say, if I'm doing lock exclusive, when I acquire that, um, uh, I know that I'm the only person who has, I'm only, at least the only person among people who are sort of participating in this locking scheme who has access to this file. Um, and for like the SQL, Lite, and other database use case, that should be the case because you should be everyone who's accessing a database file has to already be cooperating on keeping that file consistent. And so they all have to agree on the locking scheme as well. So if, uh, lock shared, um, lock exclusive, and uh, there's also try lock shared, try lock exclusive. These are sort of the, like, don't block until it's locked. Just tell me immediately if it's if it's, if it's locked and I'll go to something else for a while. Um, and then unlock. And when you have a lock, you can use unlock to release it. So these allow us to do essential file locking. Uh, they're backed by the flock mechanism on, on Unix, which is kind of a weird thing that POSIX locks ended up with this FCNTL mechanism. And the thing that's in POSIX is unfortunate because it's, it's associated with processes rather than being associated with project groups. So if two threads both try to take a lock, they'll end up sharing a lock. And so they won't actually be able to synchronize with each other. Um, so this locking API is designed after the Unix flock API, which doesn't have that behavior. So even if there's two threads or two independent plasma instances in the same host process try to lock a file, they'll properly coordinate with each other. So one person has an exclusive lock, the other person has an acquire exclusive lock, they'll wait until the first person is done. Um, even if they're in the same host process, you know, different threads in the same host process, same thread in the host process, but different plasma instances, whatever you have, um, and they'll work together. And lastly, we have a drop descriptor function. This is also something that's um, when we get real resources in, in which um, we will have this kind of thing, this kind of behavior, we uh, a built in function. Uh, but for now, we have our own function to sort of say, this is going to do the equivalent of a close on the strict descriptor to, to say that I no longer need it. Um, it doesn't return an error, which is an interesting thing. Um, POSIX close returns an error type, and uh, this does not. This says that we will never have to return an error from the close function. 
All right, I'm almost at the end here, and I'm also at the, almost at the end of my time. I'm only doing an hour today, so um, I'm going to finish up here and then take any questions really quick, and then I'll be done. So directory entry scheme, this is the type returned by the directory entry, uh, the, the read dir function. Um, it, this is also going to be a resource, which will also eventually be a stream of directory entries, because the, the built-in stream type in preview 3 will be a type stream, so we can go ahead and do a type stream for this. Um, read dir entry is just a way to say, give me the next dir entry return the result of uh, an option dir entry. So we get some, if there's one there, you get none when you hit the end. And drop dir entry stream is just the drop function for this dir entry resource, um, which will go away. This function will go away when we have real resources. And that is the end of this API. Um, and I only have two minutes left. I'm gonna probably do some, some uh, tomorrow I have scheduled a miscellaneous stream. Um, I'll probably do some, uh, clean up a multi-file system for that stream. But we have just reached the end of this API. We talked through the whole thing. We didn't do a lot of edits, but we talked through a lot of stuff. Um, let's take a look for questions at the end here. Is JavaScript the same as close? Yes, it is. It is the analog of close. Um, it has this difference I mentioned of not returning an error type, because um, this makes it unambiguous that applications don't need to check for the return type from the close. Um, I didn't realize the current WASI spec denies absolute paths. That's specified explicitly. Um, I don't know if that's specified explicitly, but it's the behavior of, of several engines, at least at this point, and it's the intention. It's how we documented it in various places. Does the locking completion require use spinning? It does not. It uses OS locking facilities. Um, so Unix has an F-lock F -lock function. Windows has a Windows API that I forget the name of off the top of my head. Um, there are OS functionality for doing file locking, so there'll be no spinning involved. Um, um, but uh, while here, that's a good point. I should document that we should have open app document that it's um, the absolute path constraints. Uh, we can do that. Where am I at here? Oh, I need to go to the edit screen. All right. Uh, are there any other questions in like the minute left we have here? All right, thanks a lot. Um, you can always reach out to me on social media. Um, uh, this is my handle. Uh, check it out, and I'll be back streaming live tomorrow at the same time, and we'll do more of this. If you enjoyed this, uh, thanks a lot. And I'll see you tomorrow, perhaps.